Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. The sinking of the Sewol one year ago highlighted, among several other issues, the failure of the Korean media to report on the unfolding situation in an accurate and professional manner. Korea's second largest newspaper, the Chungang Ilbo, published a full page apology to its readers soon after the disaster, seeking forgiveness for its faulty reporting. Our guest for this episode, John Francis Power, argues that this is only one of many examples of the various issues plaguing the Korean news landscape. In a feature article he wrote for Groove Korea last year, John depicts an industry under pressure from both government and corporate interests, and where investigative journalism and rigorous reporting are often discouraged. John Power is an Irish journalist based in Seoul since 2010. He has written over 200 articles on a broad range of Korea-related topics, including food safety, domestic violence, politics, libel law, rail safety, and various other issues. John has worked for the Korea Herald and Yonhap News, and has published his work in several international media outlets, including Christian Science Monitor, Diplomat, the BBC, Australia's ABC, and Ireland's RTE. John Power, welcome to Korea and the World. Thanks for having me. I'd like to ask you the very first question we ask all our guests. What brought you to Korea and you know, what got you here in the first place? In 2009, I think, I got a job in a newspaper in Dublin, Ireland, where I'm from. I worked there for about 10 months as a copy editor or a sub-editor, as we would call it, basically correcting grammar and spelling and sentence construction and checking facts and that sort of thing. Um, and then the Irish economy basically exploded. <laughs> so I lost my job and I decided to do a master's in journalism to sort of write out the bad economy. To graduate, you have to do a internship. Um, and I always thought it would be interesting to be able to do it abroad. So I decided I would like to go to Asia. I applied to a lot of different English language media all around Asia, Hong Kong, Philippines. And eventually the Korea Herald which is the biggest English newspaper, I think, came back to me and said, you can work for free for a few months. Um, so I came to Seoul about a day or two after I had in my thesis for my master's and I worked as an intern for three months and then they hired me as, first of all, as a copy editor and then kind of gradually I got into reporting and feature writing and just um, following stories that I thought were interesting that maybe weren't being followed elsewhere. Um, can you maybe give us a little feeling of how it is to be a um, journalist in South Korea as a foreigner? Yeah, um, well, there's some obvious things that make it difficult. The language, obviously, Korean people generally speak Korean. Then there's other things like, um, just because you're a foreigner, I, I think there can be in some quarters maybe just distrust of your position or your angle. Like, what? why do you want to write this story? That sort of mentality exists. And I think some people you know, either in government or in business or maybe just in, in other walks of life are a bit nervous about foreign media making look Korea look in a negative light to the rest of the world. So I think there would be some reticence among some people to foreign journalists. Um, and then there's sort of things like the, the media culture. Like Japan, they rely very heavily on uh, press clubs in Korea and they're kind of exclusively for Korean journalists. They have... Yeah, press conferences for foreign media every so often, but they're not as frequent and I don't think there is, I mean, they're probably not as illuminating. So it's very hard for, it's very hard for foreign journalists to get close to people in power in Korea, like, you know, ministers and high level politicians and stuff like that because of cultural differences and because you're sort of an alien in, in a new environment, you don't have necessarily the same connections that someone who's been living in Korea their whole life. So. It's, it's not necessarily very easy to get those kind of very high-level, interesting sources up close and personal in a way that maybe a Korean reporter might be able to. And then there's also um, there's legal and sort of institutional barriers like the libel law, this sort of the general reluctance among a lot of people to speak on the record. So if you look at Korean language media, there's a huge reliance on unnamed sources to a degree that... I think would be very noteworthy to a Western journalist, or at least a, a journalist of the Anglo, the Anglo world, if that's the way to put it, America mm. or the US or Ireland or Australia. Um, so that that's a bit of a challenge as well. Um, although that's something that Korean journalists 
operate in that framework too but it was something that I find I found difficult to, to get used to and still you know struggle with we'll talk about all these uh, topics in more detail later um, let's maybe start with your article um, that you wrote um, that I think was quite remarked and quite remarkable Korea's media malaise in which you say the Korean media landscape is and I quote blighted by corporate interference corruption incompetence and apathy are you implying that the media in Korea is really different and probably worse than in other democratic countries in, 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 with free press? Is there something really specific to Korea that explains at least this very yeah. violent judgment? Of well, words? first of all, just to put a disclaimer on that, I didn't write that, that strap line, so that would have oh. been an editor. Nevertheless, I mean, I think it's a fairly fair judgment, so I'm not going to you know, back away from it too much. You know, first of all, just to say, I, I don't claim to know everything about the Korean media. I don't claim to have some all-encompassing knowledge that needs to be taken as gospel. And I also would say that um, there's loads of good journalists in Korea and there's lots of good journalism in Korea. I mean, I think that should go without saying. I'm not casting aspersions on every journalist in Korea or every media outlet. I'm sure, in fact, I know lots of people do their very best to do a great job. And in a way that a lot of foreign correspondents and English language media journalists in Korea can't or are unable to, the Korean language press, you know, breaks a lot of stories that otherwise would not be reported on. Uh, to answer your question, there are ways where I can say there are instances or aspects of the Korean media that I can say quite confidently are different than in other democracies like, say, the United States, which is just a a media that everyone has some familiarity with, more so than, than, than Ireland, which is where I'm from. So for instance, as I alluded to, or as I said earlier, unnamed sources is a huge uh, crutch in the Korean media. Now, I think most journalists would accept that there are instances where you can use unnamed sources and where it's preferable and where it's demanded. If someone comes to you with some very interesting information, but they're afraid of some retaliation from their employer or the government or any individual, it's perfectly justifiable to redact their name and, and to explain to the reader as far as possible why you needed to do that. Unfortunately, in, in a lot of the Korean language media, though, even quite banal details are supported with anonymous sources and not even just people. So to the, for instance, I'll actually just give you an example from hmm. two, two days ago or something. There was an um, ad for a hagwon, an English hagwon on Craigslist. Um, and the, the advert specified Caucasians only. So a lot of foreigners sort of reacted angrily to this and started talking about it. I wrote a tweet in Korean um, just sort of saying what it was. A Korean journalist saw my tweet and then she wrote a, a story about it for her newspaper or her website. Mm -hmm. And the resulting story, it didn't name the Hagwon. It had a blurred out photo and so protected the identity of the Hagwon. Not only that, it didn't even name Craigslist. It literally said from a website called C. You know, so the level of redaction in stories is really quite amazing sometimes. Not only individuals, companies. It's quite often in, in the Korean media to read about some malfeasance or some sort of corruption from a company, but there'll be no name. So. Where does that, that come from? How do you explain this phenomenon? I mean, I'm not sure I have the complete answer myself, but I think there's a few reasons. First of all, the libel law in Korea is quite harsh, especially if we stick with the US as our reference point, especially hmm. compared to, to the United States. There's no First Amendment in Korea. There's a, there's a provision in the Korean Constitution that guarantees you know, freedom of speech for its citizens, but it's heavily qualified. The very next line lists out all these exceptions and sort of qualifying values to take into account. So the Korean libel law is, is quite a formidable piece of legislation and it, it differs from what would be the norm in a lot of other democracies in, a, in several ways. So for instance, in Korean law, it, truth is not an absolute defense. Mm -hmm. So generally in, in the United States, if you say something that's damaging about a person's reputation, if it's true, that's perfectly you know, legal and there's no real as far as I know, at most levels, I mean, there might be some nuances at different, in different states, but generally that is, you know, unassailable. If, you, if something is true, it doesn't matter if it hurts someone's reputation, the public interest is being served. Mm -hmm. In Korea, though, you can actually successfully sue someone for defamation, even if what you say is true. 
Now there is a public interest defense, but it's not absolute. So you basically are dependent of, upon the, the judgment of a judge in a particular case. Now, to be fair, I, you know, there are many cases where they will say, okay, this isn't public interest, but I still, that risk is still there. Another, th- another quite interesting difference is you can defame the dead in, in South Korea. So in most or many jurisdictions that I'm aware of anyway, once you die, your reputation, the protection of your reputation dies with you. Le- you know, you can't libel uh, Abraham Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Right? You might annoy supporters of Abraham Lincoln by, you know, tarnishing his historical record, but there's no way anyone can take you to court. In Korea, though, um, deceased people actually do enjoy legal protection of the reputation. So, for instance, about two or three years ago, uh, the former police commissioner of Seoul um, was sentenced to, I believe, two years in prison for defaming uh, No Myuhyun, which is the previous president from, I think he left office in 2007. You know, he committed suicide then sometime after. But the police commissioner made various allegations about a slush fund that had some connection to him and so forth. And um, then people on, on his behalf basically sued. The other difference which kind of leads on to this is, is that defamation in Korea is a criminal offence. So in You actually risk jail. In prison, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So unlike Britain or, or the US generally not only can you be fined, you can be actually in prison. So actually a lot of the a lot of the cases where defamation suits are brought, what actually happens is that instead of the person, you know, petitioning a court and saying, Okay, my reputation was being defamed, very often you actually have NGOs or political allies or concerned citizens suing on their behalf. This happens all the time. Um, so for instance, there's currently a Japanese foreign correspondent in Korea who's facing a potential of seven years in jail. He's been indicted, and the next court date is later this month, in fact, for supposedly defaming the president, Park uh, Gunhae. He basically um, mentioned some rumors about where she was on the day of the Seoul incident. Yeah. incident. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting about that is Park Gunhae herself, the president, didn't sue him. What happened was a a civic group, uh, you know, basically a politically sympathetic organization said, oh, you can't do that. And so there's this legal action has resulted. So, you know, there's always a debate between uh, free speech and per- people's reputation, between privacy, you know, hate speech. As you'll probably know, in European countries, for instance, there's a lot, there's a lot more restrictions on speech in terms of like racial hatred and, and that kind of thing than in the United States. But I think it's quite hard to argue that Korea's defamation provisions are not very strict by the standards of a democracy. If you consider Korea, you know, a liberal democracy, which it is by most measures, I think in most people's minds, then some of the legal provisions are quite archaic, I think, in, in my opinion. Um, so that's that's one thing. So to get back on topic, your, your, your question is why the media is different. Well, that's one thing. I think there's a, a big chilling effect on what journalists can say. Through cultural convention and through the risk of, of legal sanction, there is a, a significant restriction on, on their freedom. You know, you don't actually have to listen to me for, for this. Um, Reporters Without Borders and um, Freedom House, freedom I House. think, mm-hmm. they both do a press freedom index. Um, and Korea has basically been on a continuous downward trend for the last few years. That's a number of reasons why I think the Korean media has some problems there's also things like corporate pressure which isn't unique to korea but what is unique to korea or noteworthy about korea is the dominance of a a very small number of businesses so Hmm. you know samsung group accounts for something like 20 percent of korea's gdp which is um certainly i've never heard of any comparable situation i mean i you know if you look at general electric or boeing in the united states i can't imagine they come close now of course the u.s is a much bigger economy but but that said, the danger there is that if someone like Samsung pulls their advertising from your newspaper, that's a real problem because they are such a powerful group and they are so influential and so economically formidable you know, that it's, it's, it's quite difficult to risk annoying them. And you know, if you talk to, I would almost say, any Korean journalist, they will tell you that the Chebol exercise considerable influence on the media. Uh, 
So, for instance, when I worked um, when I worked at the Korea Herald, the Korea Herald is a small media organization in Korean terms because it's an English newspaper. It doesn't have the resources that other media would have. But nevertheless, it was relatively common to basically not write certain stories that would have a negative potential negative impact on a certain business group. And, you know, I personally have seen people come into the office, they sit down in the meeting room, and then the story that they didn't like is gone the next day. That is not a rare thing in the Korean media at all. This sort of strong arm, strong arming of, of journalists and, and media. So I think these, these things combined make the Korean media environment quite restrictive in, in a lot of ways. You also mentioned in your article that newspapers blackmail conglomerates to leverage ad revenue. So yes, there's corporate pressure, you just mentioned it, but it seems to go both ways and the media are also kind of leveraging their, their situation. Yeah, yeah when, I, when I worked at the Korea Herald, I knew for a fact that, that that's what they do. So they will go, if they find an interesting story, maybe not every time, but sometimes they'll approach you know, a certain company and say, we have this really interesting story. If you don't give us a nice advert, if you don't, you know, buy a nice advert in a newspaper, we'll print it, right? I mean, obviously, there, there's a lot of prob- problems with that. First of all, it potentially means that you never do any interesting stories. You know, second of all, you're, yeah, you're sort of blackmailing people. No, you um, are. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I, I, was in, I was interested, was this just sort of a phenomenon in, in one paper or something or, you know, my bad experience? But I, when I researched my story for Groove, I got in contact with a... A financial reporter or a business reporter who had one of the financial newspapers in Korea. She didn't want to be named because for obvious reasons but yeah I mean she confirmed the very same thing that newspapers will will approach especially I think this temptation is probably especially large when you have like a business focus like this was an economic newspaper so you know like a financial times type uh, newspaper. At certain times of the year her you know bosses and management would basically approach various business groups for for advertising and one of their means of leverage is you know that we can sort of do a story you don't like and that really just kind of violates any notion of journalistic impartiality or objectivity or uh, any anything really um so that yeah that, that's that's the reality i can't you know i haven't i didn't write a phd on this subject i can't say with certitude how widespread it is, but I, I believe in the reporter I quoted in my story did say that it was quite common. So I mean, I I can't speak to exactly how, how common, but certainly that if that sort of approach was exposed at a well respected newspaper in Britain or the U.S., I think it would attract a lot of scorn and um, criticism, and rightly so. Did you um, have to adapt to this environment yourself or were you somehow shielded as, as a foreign correspondent or foreign journalist, should I say? Yeah, the funny thing is um, when you're a foreigner in Korea, and I don't think this is just to do with journalism, but when you're a foreigner in Korea, you're definitely a foreigner. Uh, Korea is not really a multicultural country, even though it's sort of taking the first steps down that path to a degree. But you're always aware of your foreignness in Korea. And my experience at two Korean media organizations was pretty much like that. I, you also sort of benefit, in a strange way, you benefit from a sort of a, a safety blanket or a protection because when you write in English, um, a lot of people who wouldn't like your stories, who could cause you a lot of trouble, don't or can't read what you're writing. So <laughs> there's a, there's a, a sort of a, a bizarre advantage to not being as influential as you might like to be. So you, you can escape, uh, I think, a significant amount of hassle by not writing in Korean because that's more dangerous for people who don't want certain pieces of information to be exposed and so on. So you mentioned in your article something that I think is quite hard to believe uh, for uh, uninitiated audiences, and you already touched upon it in the interview, that major institutions operate their own press clubs. Mm. Um, and journalists need to quite literally earn their way in if they want to get in access to the people who matter or to, well, good stories. Can you maybe explain how these clubs work and don't they create obviously all the wrong incentives? Right, yeah, so this is kind of based off the Japanese idea. It's a holdover from the Japanese uh, colonial period, 
they call them uh, cho. so basically you have like a many Korean reporters would have a beat say the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Justice but to get access to literally to the press rooms where press conferences are given and and I suppose more generally to have access to the to people in the know uh, you have to join a press club and basically these press clubs the press club votes on who's allowed to enter so you'll have like the journalists for Chosen Ilbo or KBS or Yonhap News and then when someone wants to get that same access they vote whether we'll let this person in so um, I spoke to one reporter she previously worked with a regional television station in Gyeonggi-do and then she worked for Shisain magazine which is sort of like a liberal leaning investigative journalism magazine uh, but when she was working um, for that television station she sort of had to she sort of had to get in friendly with the people in those press clubs and sort of you know, go to lunch with them and sort of be demure, kind of be like a demure, kind of non-threatening figure and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, use your feminine charm to sort of get, to win these people's trust and respect over because basically not everyone necessarily wants the competition and don't want people on their uh, turf. But because the government, and I believe Chebel too, they restrict a lot of information to these specific forms if you can't get inside, you're obviously at a disadvantage. Um, so that creates a sort of a, a very closed access to, to information. It also creates incentives to stop people with dangerous ideas and commas or sort of excessive ambition from getting um, access to, to stories that might be you know, useful for the public interest. Do you perceive the degree of corporate influence uh, on Korean media as to be really different from elsewhere. And I'm asking this question because only a few weeks ago, the, the British media landscape was quite shaken by this, uh, this case at the Daily Telegraph. Uh, one of their lead reporters decided to resign and he accused the Telegraph of putting the interests of banks and ad revenues uh, way before their, their readers' interests. Yeah, um, it's hard to say. I mean, I've never heard of media strong arming businesses for ad revenue before. I mean, I'm not saying it's never ever happened, but it seems to be relatively common in Korea, um, and I I never remember hearing about that anywhere else. You know, it's hard it's hard to put these things into percentages and figures. You know, what percentage of the media is controlled by business? You know, indirectly or whatever. But I do think Korea's business landscape is quite unique, in that you know, ten chebol control a huge percentage of the entire economy, so. By virtue of that fact alone, there's far bigger danger in annoying a particular company. Theoretically, in a free market, even if you really piss off a company to the extent that they drop their you know, ad contracts with you, you know, theoretically, well, maybe there'll be another business who'll pick up the slack. But in Korea, there aren't very many mm. businesses you know, past a certain size. Um, so like, as I said earlier, Samsung accounts for a fifth of the economy, which is just incredible. And then, you know, if you add Samsung, Hyundai, Lotte, Posco, LG. Uh, the, 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 yeah, LG, the percentage just rises and rises. That alone, I mean, creates an obvious, obviously makes it difficult for someone to go against the grain and to go against business pressures. Slightly different point, but I think it's related. A few years ago, the former, former lawyer with uh, Samsung became a, a whistleblower and he exposed all these very, you know, um, damaging revelations about the company and so forth and you know money they had for bribing officials and prosecutors and all this sort of thing the guy who wrote that book first of all most of the media or a lot of the media wouldn't give it any coverage they completely ignored it and it's not hard to guess why and secondly secondly that guy was basically reduced to sort of um, obscurity in his personal life like he lives down the country now I think I heard that he like he runs a cafe or something like he he his he took an immense personal cost in in doing what he did and you know a lot of the media was unwilling or unable to shine a light on what he was talking about so I think that just shows you the sort of the influence that these groups have and also they 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 have targeted journalists directly for instance um and foreigners Michael Breen is um is or 
was maybe he might still be a columnist with the Korea Times newspaper um, he wrote a, satir- a satirical column a few years ago about the Christmas presents that you know various rich and powerful people would be receiving for Christmas and uh, Samsung was mentioned and they didn't like this very much so they threatened to sue him and um, you know, he had to write an apology letter and, and so on and all these things eventually they, they dropped the suit but you know you can imagine a company with billions and billions in revenue being able to hold a, a libel suit over your head for writing a satirical article um, you can imagine what kind of atmosphere that creates for people and what sort of disincentive it creates for digging into certain in certain areas. How do you explain the dichotomy that on the one hand, journalists are quite afraid of chebols and of saying anything that goes against business interests, but at the same time you mentioned there's a lot of blackmail going on? Well, I don't think it's a really, I don't think it's a contradiction. I mean, it's, um, they're thinking about their survival. I mean, if they, if they really felt independent from the business groups, they wouldn't need to resort to those sort of tactics, right? They would be able to pursue stories without fear or favor and, you know, hopefully find enough advertising to, to keep the ship sailing. I mean, I, I, yeah, I understand. Is it, is it more fear or is it more symbiotic? I mean, I guess it, sometimes it is symbiotic. I mean, I think that some editors and some journalists probably don't want to investigate these things and don't care and don't have the same idea about journalism being adversarial and um, robust that maybe other journalists do. So I think some of it is maybe a deference and not a fear. Um, but but either way, it's it's corrosive to the to media freedom, I think. What about the uh, Korean government? Does the government provide subsidies to the media? Um, it does in some instances. It um, Yonhap News, which is the Korean wire service in the vein of um, you know, Reuters or AP, definitely does receive government money. And KBS is the state broadcaster, so I believe that does too. But I don't think newspapers generally do as a rule. Uh, I'm not sure what sort of tax incentives or something like that they might receive, but there's a state broadcaster and a state wire service. Talking about the relationship between the government and the media, the starting point of your article, uh, Korea's Media Malaise, was the coverage of the, the Sewol incident, which you mm-hmm. dubbed a low point in Korean journalism. And you were saying that the newspapers had a tendency to just copy-paste government bulletins that were sometimes incorrect instead of doing their own, well, research. And so how do you explain that the media didn't do their own fact-checking or just conducted a normal journalistic investigation on the side? Well, let me first say that that perception isn't really mine so much as one shared by a lot of Korean citizens and fellow journalists and maybe as well the victims of that uh, tragedy. You know, that event was, was very sort of huge in the national consciousness for a lot of reasons. But one of the significant side aspects of it was the media response. There was a lot of inaccurate reporting in the hours and days afterwards. I actually, I mean, I remember first of all when it, when the story first broke in the morning, it might have been 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., something like that, the media pretty much en masse, I believe, reported that most of the people had been rescued, that this was essentially quite a small an accident, but not nothing of the scale that we later learned about. So the, the authorities gave wildly inaccurate um, figures about those rescued and about those left on board, and the media basically repeated those. To be fair, though, I mean, I think in natural disasters and you know, terrorist attacks, these sort of really huge calamitous events, it's quite common for media anywhere to get things wrong because they're scrambling for for information and things aren't always clear. You know, I think that's forgivable to a certain extent, but I think what is worse and more deserving of scrutiny is, is the way that basically there is, um, you know, censorship of certain types of news stories. So there's an organization or a, an, an institution called the Korea Communications uh, Commission and they regulate a lot of the you know the broadcasting standards and that body is um, heavily weighted toward the ruling political bloc. Um, so there are a lot of people who criticize or question the impartiality of their decisions when they sanction 
broadcasters and and that sort of thing. So, someone who I quoted in my story was、uh, Park Young Shin, who is a a professor and also just a general advocate of freedom of expression. And we actually、media. interviewed them. Right.、Mm. Yeah. Um. So he he was one of the people who was very critical about a lot of their decision making. Um. I believe that he some of his criticism did actually relate to Sawal as well. But generally, he he lists、um, several situations where, you know, basically, the regulatory authorities came down on the side of the government or the side of the story that was most favorable,、um, you know, to the government. That's one thing. Another thing is that, unfortunately, it's been my experience that not every journalist I met actually really is that interested in journalism, which sounds. Kind of unbelievable, but it's been my experience, where some people seem more interested in sort of being、uh, stenographers for the press releases that they receive than really doing any sort of thorough digging into into a situation. Why that mentality exists, I, I don't know. It's a very multifaceted question. One thing I looked at in my story was. The education that journalists receive and the process through which journalists are chosen, basically, like a lot of career paths in Korea,、um, there's a heavy exam element in in Korean newsrooms. Korean aspiring journalists actually study a massive sort of telephone directory size book of general knowledge, which, in one sense, you know, one can see the logic of, but essentially, the, the this sort of curricula basically. Claims to sort of provide someone with knowledge about almost everything. Like you'll have, who is Alexander the Great, and who is、hmm. like you know what year was Microsoft founded, or it's it really just almost an endless stream of topics. But it's worthy of you know skepticism to what extent that really prepares someone for the sort of skeptical and adversarial mindset that I think a journalist needs to possess. So yeah, I I think that's that's an issue. I think. You know, it's it's difficult to pin these things down, but Korea has only been a democracy for as long as I've been alive. There's still a very、um, real authoritarian streak in Korean society, I think, and I think part of that will extend to the media as well. You know, you know, if you think about someone now who's a newspaper editor, when they were、uh, a young journalist, they lived in a dictatorship. You know, that's the simple reality of of the situation. So does someone in such an environment risk absorbing some of the assumptions and some of the deferences to authority? I think maybe, maybe so. I'm not. I'm not saying that that applies to every news editor or every person in charge.、Um, but my personal experience of writing in a Korean media organization was that there were some topics that you're not really supposed to write about, and I've seen that replicated across other media, including including Korean language media. So it's not. It's not good enough to just say that this is just one English newspaper because it's something that Korean journalists will complain about too. Coming back to、um, defamation, you mentioned that you can be sued even if your article is factually correct. Yes. Does that mean it is not feasible for the press to take into account、um, the testimony of a whistleblower, or generally to be critical of the government? Since, as Park Kim-shin actually mentioned in his interview, by definition, the government knows what is the truth, and so can. <laughs> well, I mean, I I do want to be nuanced about this. I I certainly would not say that the Korean media never criticizes the government. I mean, they certainly do. In particular, there are certain newspapers like the Hankyore, which almost is set up to criticize the government, especially if it's a conservative government, because they're a liberal newspaper. Um, and as at the moment, it's a conservative administration, as you know. So、mm. I, I certainly wouldn't say that journalists or newspapers or media in Korea never criticize the government. However, I would say that there are consequences to criticizing the government in Korea that would be more difficult to observe in some other jurisdictions, you know, liberal democracies, and that you know naturally will weigh on anyone who cares about self-preservation. You know, so as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a foreign、um, correspondent potentially facing seven years in prison, which you know is the kind of thing you expect to hear about in Iran or you know Venezuela or these sort of poster poster boys of, of anti liberal regimes and so on. But you know, actually, that's something that can happen here. 
And actually, that, that case was interesting because, because it was a foreign journalist and because journalists are you know, egotistical and look out for their own, because it's a foreign journalist, the foreign press covered that quite heavily, like Reuters and AP, they all wrote about it because it was sort of striking. But you know, plenty of Korean journalists have suffered um, repercussions for writing negative articles about Korean government uh, figures and that those sort of cases don't necessarily make the Western press as easily because they're a little bit more obscure to a to a foreign observer. There's many examples of of those um, sort of cases. Um, Is this the general atmosphere in the press since Korea's democratization, or do you feel that since, let's say, Im Yong Bak and since the conservatives are in power, that yeah. there is more of a clamp down on on yeah. the media? That's an interesting question. Um, I will okay. I will say that the the foreign NGOs like um, were Reporters Without Borders and Freedom House, who I respect, but I would also say, you know, every index has certain assumptions, has certain criteria, right? There's no such thing as a perfect representation of press freedom, right? Uh, however, I do think those organizations are credible. And since Emil Bak and, and Park and Hay have been in power, Korea's ranking has gen generally declined. So many people would argue that it has gotten worse, particularly liberal Koreans, but maybe not just. Um, so I think it's I think it's fair to to say that press freedom has perhaps gotten worse in the last five, six, seven, eight years. However, at the same time, I would personally be quite cautious about framing this solely as like a liberal conservative issue. Because um, when liberal administrations have been in power, they've shown themselves to be quite open to restricting the press in certain ways. So for instance, No Mi Hyun, who was the second liberal, second and last liberal president, Uh, he uh, attempted to sue um, a number of conservative newspapers who very aggressively criticized him. And the three main newspapers in Korea are considered conservative. So he, you know, he was arguably in a very unfriendly press atmosphere, but nevertheless, um, he, you know, tried to intimidate the press with, with, with lawsuits. And actually, for my article, I was really interested in, in learning, you know, and seeing it through the history. And... I think one of the things that I found when I when I looked at, at it was that every administration in Korea has had defamation or you know legal suits taken on behalf of the government. So I think it was either every or every except one and then except one they you know they did other things that basically restricted journalists. So you know in my opinion Korea's never really had a very open press atmosphere from what I can see when I look back at other cases throughout history. Now, on the other hand, considering that it, it was under military rule for 50 years or so, or 40, you can say that it's made strides and that it's it's come a long way and that, you know, there's a lot of countries in Asia who are in worse position. But I would say that the idea that this is just a, cons a recent conservative thing I think is a bit of a myth. I don't think that the hostility to freedom of expression in Korea goes back a lot further than that. The libel law goes back further than that. The national security law, uh, which is a big influence on journalists, which I haven't mentioned, that goes back further than that. So, um, and also, you know, I'm not a, an anthropologist or a, a, a sociologist or whatever, but not every culture or society necessarily sees the questions of freedom of expression in the same light, right? You know, France or Germany don't have the First Amendment. America has the First Amendment. They have their own ways of looking at these things. In France, I'm not an expert in France, but from what I hear, pri privacy is a is a you know considered a very important value in France, right? So, to to kind of assume that everyone in Korea thinks about these issues the same way as everyone in in Paris or New York or you know Timbuktu, I think is a bit naive. If you look at the secrecy with which information is is held in the public domain here i think that it would seem that people maybe are concerned about privacy i mean one one really amazing thing in, in korea is that convicted criminals are almost never named in the media if you go out tonight and kill three people the next day in the media it will just say pak king e hmm. so even you know even if you do some quite heinous things your your identity is protected um, so there's just not the same level of transparency or openness 
that you would expect in Anglo media around the world. I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think some of it might be you know, societal or cultural as well. You mentioned the uh, national security law having a huge influence on, on the media. Can you maybe explain uh, what, what it entails? Sure. Uh, the national security law is a law that's been in place since, I believe, um, the 60s, certainly for many decades, which basically criminalizes any sort of praise or propagation of North Korean ideas. So in South Korea, it's a crime to basically praise the socialist system of North Korea. However, this law has been applied in very, very broad ways on occasion. So, for instance, a few years ago, a Korean on Twitter retweeted, um, I forget the exact nature of his message, but basically he retweeted something like the North Korean flag and some sort of propaganda slogan. Now, he claimed that he was doing it satirically, like this is ridiculous. Nevertheless, he was indicted and prosecuted. So, and, and to this day, you can't go onto the internet in, in South Korea legally or without a VPN and look at um, you know, the government websites in North Korea, the news, the KCNA, the North Korean news or propaganda service. You can't read these things in North Korea because they're, they're illegal. And actually a lot of the internet in Korea is um, censored for that and for other reasons like you know, sexual morality reasons and this sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, the, the national security law, I think, is a, is a big influence on, on freedom of expression in Korea because if you have a zealous prosecutor, you could potentially prosecute someone for, for statements that don't really even praise North Korea, but simply maybe, you know, shine a more sympathetic, sympathetic yeah. light. Exactly. So this is nothing to do with my personal feelings about North Korea, but basically, you know, you walk a very thin legal line when you decide to sort of say positive things about North Korea and obviously that's a a something to consider for anyone expressing themselves and including in the media there's no dispensation for for a journalist as far as I'm aware so you concluded your article um, Korea's media malaise with the idea that maybe the Koreans have the media they deserve in the sense that people have not been educated enough about what constitutes good journalism so I wanted to know, is that still your assessment? And do you think that only this bottom-up approach um, can solve the situation? Again, I will say that, that that was what was told to me by several people, quite consistently, actually. Um, journalists, journalists and professors. It wasn't really an opinion that I came to. It was what I was told by people who, who should know. And it makes sense in, in a, to, to a large degree because, you know, news consumers are consumers right you know people like to put media on sort of a, a pedestal like it's above you know other products but it is a product as well and if people want a good product they kind of have to pay for it or shop for it with their eyes or what however you know you support journalism but they have to choose it right and so yeah it was something that i was told consistently was that people don't demand or expect or know what to look for in journalism i think that's something that that risk exists exists everywhere because um, you know people are busy. They have short attention spans. Um, they don't have time or the inclination to spend a long time reading to a long piece. And I found personally in my own you know relatively short career that some of the stories that I'm most proud of personally in in terms of what I think they revealed or in terms of the effort I put into them got some of the smallest or you know very little reaction and people don't necessarily news viewers don't necessarily see the difference you know nowadays it's very common for a, a lot of a lot of news is basically just copied and pasted from somewhere else you know a, a lot of you know these Huffington Post Daily Beast type outlets in particular they basically just get the news from somewhere and like rewrite it but they get like a uh, hundred thousand shares on Facebook right so if you're the if you're the journalist at the New York Times who made like ten phone calls and 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 you know was driving around the city all day to get that information, you might feel a little sore about that, right? But does everybody realize the does everybody see the difference in, in effort and, and perseverance? And probably not. So I don't I don't know if it's just a, a, a Korean issue. But like what was in the Korean context what was posited to me was that that there's still an authoritarian mentality in, in, in too many people and that there's still 
not enough uh, skepticism about what those in power are doing or not enough you know inquiry and, and stuff like that I, don't, I certainly don't want to give the impression that the Korean people are just sort of sheep en masse and be, mm. they're just being brainwashed and believe lies. I mean, you know, if you walk around Seoul, pe- people, Korean people are protesting all the time. There's lots of opposition, especially in, in certain instances and at certain points in time. But, you know, I, I do think that people... I, I, I do, I, at the risk of sounding like a cultural imperialist, I do think that Korean media and by extension Korean society would benefit from an atmosphere where information was more openly um, circulated, where sources were named, where, you know, information wasn't restricted to, you know, elite clubs of reporters that, you know, only a certain number of big name journalists can get into. If the if the defamation law was was revised into a more civil orientated um, mechanism like you would see in in the US or Britain. I think that, you know, all of those things would would help Korean journalism and by extension help Korean society. Like it's very easy to talk about these things in sort of lofty principles and on and so on. But you know, if you break it down to individual cases, there's so many instances where you can see what's wrong with the media you you see here. So, for instance, just to give one example, I wrote some years ago. I wrote about a travel agent who had defrauded customers out of, um, I think, over a hundred thousand dollars in total from different people. He would basically he would book a flight, and maybe you'd end up get stuck in like Moscow with no transfer or whatever. And like, it was it was pretty terrible because people would be going to like you know, you know their honeymoon or something, and they're stuck in you know. A lot of elastic or whatever. I'm, I'm sure it's a lovely place, but it's not the Bahamas. So anyway, he defrauded these people. We wrote about it in the Korea Herald. Uh, especially, we got to it early because it involved foreigners in particular. And so, you, when you're a foreign journalist in Korea, you get a lot of complaints from foreigners, and you're kind of the only place for those complaints to go. So we did that, and then after a while, the the guy was arrested, let go. He changed his name and changed his business name and just kept doing it and like did it under another name. Then we wrote about that and then he was arrested again and was prosecuted. So he was prosecuted and the the Korean press picked up in a a relatively small way because it's not not a huge story, I suppose. But I remember when my managing editor came up to me and and he was like, oh, John, look, it's in, I forget the newspaper, but it's in one of the Korean language newspapers. And that was kind of gratifying or that's nice, whatever. But, you know, it not only did it not name the guy, it didn't ma- name the business. So you have a situation where a guy is going around defrauding people out of their hard-earned money. And really, this news report that you have is, is kind of useless in terms of being, being able to protect yourself as a consumer. Because, you know, you don't know his name, you don't know his business, you don't, like, there's no information that I can glean from this article to protect myself. And isn't the point of journalism to inform yourself so you can make decisions about the world? So too many media reports in Korea speak in generalities. So, you know, racism happened at this Hagwon. So, okay, well, racism is bad. Let's do something about racism. Oh, there was fraud. Fraud is bad. Let's do something about fraud. But, but on a more fundamental level, if you want to be an informed consumer or an informed citizen, you're not allowed to take action against that institute or that business or that individual. And I want to say take action. I don't mean some vigilante mm. violence. I mean, you know, to take your business elsewhere or... To protest or to boycott the things that happen in 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 jurisdictions when people are unhappy with a certain situation you know you need to know who your target is but in in the korean media we just get sort of a, a general report where the business isn't named where the people aren't named no one's named and at some point it it feels like these sort of reports are just impotent because there's no way that a normal person can use them to their advantage in any way. Do you see opportunity in Korea for new media, such as the likes of Vice.com or independent blogs, or what I would call serious infotainment, such as Last Week Tonight's? Do you see that emerging in Korea, maybe as a reaction to the Defin- Definitely. I mean, Korea, they like saying here that Korea is one of the most wired countries in the world. It's almost like a, it's like a slogan, TM. Um, and it is true that Koreans are very you know, connected to the internet, the broadband's very fast, everyone has a smartphone. And there are, like, one example, Oh My News, 
which I think started just around when Naomi Hun was coming to power, and I think is generally known as being sort of liberal in its outlook. Uh, that was sort of a citizen journalism website where just ordinary people contributed a lot of stories, and it's still going, I believe. So the, you know, there's a huge there's a huge amount of media in Korea and a huge amount of websites. I like I'm. I'm always amazed every time I, I look at Neighbor, there's always some website I've never heard of. Um, and there's, there's bloggers and that kind of thing. I do think there is room for those sort of people, certainly. But I also think that for them to really flourish, there needs to be some sort of reform of certain legal and institutional barriers, like I, I mentioned uh, previously. I mean, there is recently they, they started um, Saturday Night Live in Korea. However, I think that a lot of people would see there being a lack of biting satire in Korea, a, a, you know, reluctance to really go after tricky political subjects because there's there's just not the same there's just not the same protection of satire or or expression generally. No one really thinks that you know John Stewart is going to get a letter from the White House, you know, summoning him before court to, to face years in prison or something but that sort of potential actually exists in Korea so if you a lot of a lot of the Korean the mainstream comedy they're mostly or they're largely sort of slapstick humor wordplay you know laughing at cultural differences it's not you know it's not any threat to the president right mm. so I think it's a lot more difficult to, to do those kind of jokes and it's a lot more restrictive you know making sort of sensitive political jokes is not something that is very easy to do so you know there are satirical cartoons and so forth but it's just not as it's just more dangerous I mean only recently um, the police announced that they were investigating the distribution of posters that were mocking Park and Hay and so this is something that the police thought was worthy of investigating so in that kind of environment I think it's always going to be more difficult. There's always going to be people who go against the grain and, and I'm sure I'm not an expert on the you know the, co- the comedic scene here but it, I think it is harder to take those risks here. John to um, end on a positive note I hope um, is there any uh, is there any domestic media in Korea that you think is upholding very high standards and could maybe be a, a role model for the industry? I, I, I read news reports in, in Korean relatively regularly but you know, I don't go to the entire Chosan Ilbo. It would take me a week for a start, um, or the Han Kure or whatever. So I'm not sure I can sort of pick one above all others, but there are journalists that I've met and, and respect and that I, I know from talking to care about hard-hitting journalism. Um, and I think, you know, there are... You, I think you can find good journalism in the Chosan Ilbo, in the Han Kure, in the Chungan Ilbo. But I think often it's just maybe what they don't talk about. And the norms, as I said earlier, the norms that are just aren't adhered to. It's just, it's just commonplace to not do things a certain way here. That would be odd elsewhere. I would mention I can give actually in English and maybe for your, your listeners that would be accessible would be the Korea Observer is a website that started quite recently. And I know, the, I know that guy personally, he comes from he previously worked at Korea Times, um, but he certainly is someone who thinks that the media is not doing all it all it can, and he certainly some of his uh, I won't comment on every story, but some of the stories they've done have been quite hard hitting, and also have done things like just name the people involved. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously you have to be careful, you know, to not libel people just want, uh, with abandon, but at the same time. You know, it's a good position to start from that we're actually going to talk about what we're talking about with identifiable places and people and names. And I think he's uh, trying to do that. And his website doesn't have many resources. And I think they they easily match the Korea Herald or the Korea Times in their reporting quite often. On full disclosure, I should say that I wrote a piece for them about two weeks ago. So I'm not. if anyone says I'm just <laughs> shilling for them, well, I did re- write one story for them. So... But yeah, I mean, there's, and there's good journalists in... I saw a good report in the Career Herald recently about um, uh, crowdfunding and Kickstarter-type organizations in Korea, and I thought that was interesting. It's not something I'd read about before, and there are people who try their best, certainly. Um, but it's hard for me to pick one organization 
you know, overall. There'd be people who would know better than me, I think. Uh, our listeners should know that Korea and the World is now syndicated on Korea Observer. Oh, okay, right. So we're both shows then. That's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, John, uh, thank you very much for your time and for being our guest today. Oh, thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.